Thanks, Xavier. Uh, hopefully I've automatically mastered the microphone. Um, in a moment, um, it's my great privilege to um, introduce our first speaker for this afternoon's session, Louise Clegg. Um, and she will, in a moment, commence her address, which is titled, Losing Our Legend, Why Our Wash Minister is Vulnerable to Entrenching Identity. Louise was educated at the University of Sydney, where she obtained a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Laws. She commenced practice as a solicitor at Clayton Utes before being admitted to the bar in New South Wales in 2000. She was awarded the Blaschke Prize for the highest score in the New South Wales bar entrance exam. At the bar, Louise practices and specialises in public law and employment law. Throughout her practice, she has had a remarkably successful career having conducted over 100 federal court appeals. She has also appeared both led and unled in a number of appeals before the full federal court. Louise has appeared as junior counsel in the New South Wales Court of Appeal and the High Court in public law matters with leading public law silks, as well as appearing in hundreds of judicial review cases in the federal circuit court. Uh, from time to time, Louise, um, away from the law, has held uh, legal teaching positions at both the Australian National University and the University of New South Wales, and she also serves on a number of boards, currently including the United States Studies Centre, the Sydney Institute, the Country University Centre, and the Goulburn and District Education Foundation. Uh, please join me in welcoming Louise to the lecture this afternoon. Thank you, Amy, and um, thanks to the Samuel Griffiths Society for having me. Um, as some of you would know, I have been doing a little bit of advocacy around The Voice, and yes, it is advocacy, and I don't apologise for that. Um, but most of it's been in sort of thousand-word pieces. Um, and so when you're writing thousand, a thousand words for um, newspapers, you can't really um, step outside the, the lane and you can't get much away from one or two central points. Um, but it's a lovely opportunity really to um, talk about something um, that I've been thinking about for some time actually and prior to the voice coming on our radars. Um, and that is um, the problem of identity politics, um, not just in this nation but um, around the world. Um, well, I probably did start thinking about it at a, at a time quite close to when the voice began to be spoken of, and I don't think that is, a, that is an, um, an accident. So the voice sort of first began being spoken about and talked about, certainly not in public discourse, but amongst academics. Um, it was conceived in 2014. That's nearly a decade ago, and I think really that's how long um, identity politics in this country has sort of been starting to... Um, get a bit of an edge. So at a time when the Supreme Court of the United States of America has re-embraced the US Constitution's 1868 Equal Protection Clause, our country is proposing to insert into its constitution an inequality clause. There is something profound going on here, and it's not that the US and Australia are going in the opposite directions. We're in fact addressing the same big questions. It's just that in the US, as is often the case, the Supreme Court gets to make the big call on their big equality issue. And in Australia, our big equality issue will be decided, unusually in this case, by the people. So today I ask and seek to answer the question how and why our country will in less than two months time head to the polling booths to vote on a proposal to change the constitution to insert a new body which will provide positive political rights for a group which comprises only 3.8% of us. On those polling booths, people will be hurling racial abuse at each other because the proponents on each side of this debate truly believes 
that the other side is racist. This audacious proposal to insert identity politics into our constitution puts the character of our modern, prosperous, egalitarian, multicultural, yet tolerant and harmonious liberal democracy, yes, our very legend, at risk. For reasons I will explain, it is close to inconceivable that this could happen elsewhere, at least in this point in time. How on earth did we get here? I personally see three factors at work. The first is related to the scourge of identity politics. This is the first attempt to entrench the politics of identity in a written constitution of a first world liberal democracy in a palpable way, in my opinion. It raises mammoth equality and therefore rule of law issues for our country and could have knock-on impacts in advanced democracies around the world. Second, in Australia, we are vulnerable because it is fair to say that, relatively speaking, we are a society without an intimate understanding of our history. As a polity, we lack awareness of and are not inclined to celebrate the foundations of the society in which we prosper. We can see this clearly going back to 1901 by what our founders chose to include, and perhaps more importantly, not include, in the written text of our constitution. For better or worse, those choices define us today. Lastly, for whatever reason, we have collectively failed our Aboriginal people, or at least a good number of them. That ongoing failure makes us vulnerable in a polarised popula polarise populist era to a solution grounded in overreach. The failure gives the impression that those of us who defend the core, core tenets of liberal democracy in the voice debate are defending a system that has provided no answers. So today I simply want to explore those, these points so that beyond this seismic but terrible lose-lose event in our nation's history, whatever the outcome, some reflection on why it happened might help us to better heal and solve the very big problems that will inevitably emerge, whatever the outcome. First, we need to understand that this voice is a manifestation of identity politics. What do I mean when I use that term and why is it a very bad idea to entrench it in a written constitution? What is the significance of this phenomenon that has acquired almost quasi-religious status in our elite institutions in the last decade or so? Why is it a threat to the equality of citizenship and the rule of law? Well, that is simple. At the very apex of the conception of the rule of law is the notion that every citizen is equal before the law, yet central to the conception of identity-based politics is that there should be different rules for different people. To explain identity politics, I always start with Francis Fukuyama. In 1989, as many of you will know, a little-known young political scientist, Francis Fukuyama, published an essay titled The End of History. He followed it in 1992 with a book called, titled The End of History and the Last Man. Fukuyama argued that the Cold War marked the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the triumph of liberal democracy as the final form of human government. The reference, to, the reference to Nietzsche's last man suggested that the end state would not exactly be utopian. Man would be complacent, uninspired and passive, but he would be safe from major political upheaval because all of the world's political order, political order would be settled. It was a big call, but understandable. By the time the book was published, the Berlin Wall had fallen, Germany had reunified, the Soviet Union had collapsed, Thatcher and then Major and Reagan respectively were in power, Mandela had been released, and apartheid in South Africa was coming to an end. Democracy was in rude health, apparently strong and spreading. Subsequent events, however, including the rise of new kinds of populism, unexpected new polit uh, conflicts, increasing deliberalisation as opposed to liberalisation of China's politics soon began to unravel and put a dent in Fukuyama's thesis. Fast forward to Trump and Brexit and beyond, by 2018, Fukuyama had changed his tune in a big way. In his book titled Identity, the Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment, Fukuyama suggests that the need to affirm identity is deeply root rooted in the human psyche, but posits that fragmentation based on identity is a direct threat to democracy at the point when identity, or tribal politics, begins to override national unity. Fukuyama is not the only centrist, and I do consider him a centrist, um, or even left-leaning scholar to arrive at this point, but he is most certainly the most interesting because of the serious about-face that he has done. 
He argues that identity-based claims made around universal characteristics such as group-based economic interests are ultimately not a threat to democracy, but identity claims focused on immutable characteristics of gender, race, sexuality, religion, ethnicity are unsustainable and destructive of democracy when taken too far, ultimately because they are exclusionary. The academic roots of identity politics are entwined in a range of social justice movements and theoretical frameworks such as feminism, critical race theory, civil rights generally, queer movements, indigenous movements. They emphasise identity in shaping individual experiences, relationships, interactions with broader society. These intellectual currents have influenced how people engage with the issue of diversity, inequality and social change. Proponents of identity politics argue that it brings vitality to democracy and facilitates facilitate social justice. They're right. But at what cost? Well, if it gets out of hand, the cost is serious division. By focusing too much on group-based grievances, identity politics leads to the fragmentation of the polity. The emphasis on the distinct uh, supersedes the shared sense of citizenship that is essential to a healthy democracy. It is impossible to think of a better ex of example of this than the big question that is dividing us now. Scholars out of the US and Europe highlight how identity politics can fuel political polarisation and gridlock. When political discourse revolves around identity, it obliterates the standing or authority to engage by those who are not members of the identity group. It goes something like, you can't understand or even criticise my grievance because you have no connection to my identity. This means it becomes almost impossible to find common ground or to engage in constructive debates. Think, this is what Indigenous people want. We have no basis to question it. We've heard a lot of that in this debate. Related to this is the idea that there are different rules for different groups of people. By prioritising group-specific interests over universal principles, described as particularism by philosopher Martha Nussbaum, it erodes the idea of equal rights for all citizens. This hinders effective policy development and breaks down ordinary democratic processes. Think the deliberate lack of provision for any public debate at all for the voice referendum, and the notion that we can dispense with equality concerns as it's just a bit too complex in this instance, or this is a special case where we need not concern ourselves with, with equality. Again, we're hearing a lot of that. And of course there is the terrible impact on crucial public discourse. Identity politics stifles free exchange of ideas by imposing norms of political correctness. Slovenian philosopher and cultural critic Slavoj Zizek warns that this can lead to a culture of self-censorship, undermining the vibrant public discourse that is essential for a healthy democracy. This has an echo chamber effect, compounds the exclusionary narrative, shuts down or worse, cancels defectors. The result is that the debate and critical evaluation of the claims of the identity group are diminished and insufficient scrutiny is afforded to those claims. Again, think the claims of racism directed at no advocates generally, but even worse, the attempts to shut down lawyers by one of the country's most senior lawyers and the terrifying failure of our legal representative bodies to even provide a platform for lawyers to respectfully debate and interrogate the insertion of an entirely new chapter in our constitution. Despite the fact that like the rest of the population, probably half of the nation's lawyers will vote no or yes, those of us who are on for a debate have been called racist, delegitimised and deplatformed. The result is that many Australian lawyers who would have serious standing and authority in this debate and who are genuinely apoplectic about this proposal are self-censoring. I venture to suggest that this is, this is the first time this has ever happened in an Australian referendum. So we are left with the model of a voice that 18 million people are asked to vote on which has not been publicly interrogated or scrutinised, or certainly not sufficiently. There is a pretense that the government's constitutional expert group, a group of people, eminent lawyers, appointed by the government, paid by the government or the taxpayer, and chaired, this group is chaired by a member of the government, the Attorney General, are all members, or all ardent proponents and even campaigners for the voice. The notion that the, this model has been scrutinised or interrogated by this group of people uh, is, of course, not, is, is, of course, wrong. This is not scrutiny at all. 
The lack of interrogation of the claims of the voice means we have not even begun to consider any unintended consequences. This is a recipe for disaster. Of course, in Australia, the voice is exhibit A of identity politics at the moment, but just the latest manifestation of an increasingly aggressive identity politics, which is pulsing through our political media, professional and corporate institutions. In recent years, the calamitous way in which mere allegations, seriously contested sexual assault allegations against both Christian Porter and Bruce Learman were pursued not just by Brittany Higgins, but by powerful political and media actors have also exposed this country's defences to the politics of identity as almost non-existent. Driven by a Me Too movement, infused with identity mantras and with an acute sense of political opportunity, the forces determined to use these allegations, one of them three decades old with a dead complainant, to frame a government as having a so-called problem with women. Just about every rule in the book was broken. The movement undermined the, presump the presumption of innocence by abandoning what we all assumed were rules and norms of professional practice, media reporting and other institutional responses. The episodes divided us, damaged us and continue to do so. The message out of this on the Me Too side is that if you are a member of a group that is high on the identity hierarchy, you can prosecute your case in a high-handed manner, behave with impunity, breach pretty much every convention and yet get special privileges and favours at the end of it. If you are not a member of an identity group or a paid up supporter of the group, watch out because if you don't sign up, one day you too could be a target. In other words, different rules are applied or rules are applied differently for different people. This is and has been poison to our democracy. Your average Australian senses it and it makes them angry. Words, uh, so, so why does our Westminster make us vulnerable in this world of identity politics? Words in constitutions matter and help to define societies, at least in advanced liberal democracies, they do. We are vulnerable here in Australia because we have no formal defences to identity politics in our constitution. For the most part, the choices made by our founders have served us incredibly well and stood the test of time. Yet our expressed and implied so-called constitutional limitations and the unexpressed conventions and norms that hold the show together are not written down in one place and they do not come from our own history. They come from the histories of other countries. We don't have a history whereby we installed a new king and queen while at the same time passing through the parliament the first substantive parliamentary bill of rights. This brought to an end centuries long bloody, bloody sectarian history between the Magna Carta and the Glorious Revolution that resulted in what we in the Anglosphere still refer to as the famous English liberties. We never established a republic of virtue based on liberty, equality, fraternity. And our Washminster was not predicated by arguably the most iconic political declaration of all modernity, in which it was announced that certain truths were self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Likewise, we have no famous speech by Martin Luther King that we can draw on. The best we've conjured up in this voice debate is an observation by Bob Hawke in the 1988 Press Club address that there is no hierarchy of dissent and no privilege of origin. Now, those are terrific words, but I confess I'd never heard about them until this voice debate. Now, we know why our founders uh, did not include a Bill of Rights or any other rights framework in the Constitution. At the time, we were very British, and British legal tradition relied on the protection of rights through the common law, through statutes and conventions. The Constitution ultimately established a federal system of government that was itself considered a safeguard against the abuse of liberties. This required the American bit in order to allocate power as between the Commonwealth and the states and to define the limits of the three arms of government. We, we took a lot from America, and of course, we had to write it down. But we put the cloak of Westminster over this, framing a system of representative and responsible government with a couple of bits being codified, but a lot left out. The aim was to create a flexible and adaptable constitutional framework that would accommodate changing circumstances over time. The innovative section 128, which requires a, a direct vote from the people to change the constitution, was key to that. We also know at the time of formation of all advanced liberal democracies, whether they had colonial histories or not, Real substantive equality did not exist 
in those constitutions or in societies at the time. But over time, as the arc of history, justice, and indeed equality kept marching, we pretty much got there. In the US, after the Bill of Rights was ratified, there were many more equality moments, notably after the Civil War, including the 13th, 14th, 15th, 19th, 24th and 26th Amendments. They were the abolition of, of slavery, the Equal Protection Clause, the right to vote for all in 1870, but that wasn't really all. Then in 1920, the right for women to vote, and then further voting rights um, innovations, or not innovations, but it basically it represented the enlargement of the franchise over about a century until everyone did in fact have a right to vote. In Australia, our single equality moment was the 67 referendum, a unifying moment. But true to form, there was no expressed values, no entrenched right. We just took out of the text the bits that we thought were not terribly good or, or, or didn't suit the times. It is probably a futile thought experiment to ask whether in defeating the voice and protecting our Westminster from identity politics, we would be better off if we had some words somewhere to point to so we could say, this is who we are, this is what makes all of us one, and these are the values for all time that we have. Because if we did have those things, we would likely be a somewhat different society. We would probably have less of the lackadaisical in our culture. We would have a High Court more regularly adjudicating on political questions. In an age of polarisation and populism, we would likely have a more muscular and contested policy, uh, contested political polity. But I do think it is valuable to ponder that if our constitution contained an equality clause, the academics who came up with this voice model would not, or indeed not probably, could not have gone near it. And even without an equality clause, a clear set of defined individual political rights which apply equally to everyone would mean we'd have a society more imbued with individual political rights, which would better understand as a society, and not just at the Samuel Griffiths Society, that an unprecedented political group right that operates over and above the rights of other citizens, citizens is a skewer through the heart of liberal democracy. Now, before I start a riot, I'm not suggesting the Samuel Griffiths Society starts a campaign for a Bill of Rights, but we do need to acknowledge the value of education in having things written down. So think about this. In Australia, after 123 years since Federation, we are skipping wholesale over any kind of entrenchment of individual political rights and running headlong into entrenching a group right. I am not the only one for years to have lamented the lack of civics education's education in our schools, but I imagine how the voice will be taught in our schools. It is totally foreseeable that this pervasive lack of education in Australia about our history and our democratic values will continue, but the new group right for the voice or for indigenous, indigenous Australians through the voice will be taught and celebrated to the exclusion of other democratic values. The mind boggles at where this ends up. By political science and philosophy standards, when put, its, put in its historical and constitutional context, this is why I often say privately to people that this proposal is nothing other than completely wild. Many say it's not. They say this is all a logical and desirable evolution of democracy. Many have said that. Uh, but an article penned by respected University of Sydney political philosopher Professor Duncan Ivanson and published last year argued eloquently that the voice is not a repudiation of liberalism, but rather an expression of liberal democratic values now deeply informed by true reckoning with our colonial past and present. It's similar to what the Solicitor General said but at least Professor, Professor Iverson gave some reasons. He says, it's not a simple assertion of identity claims. It's not a call for separatism. Rather, the voice is a call for democratic innovation in how we address our past and chart a better future. It was an eloquent and optimistic assessment of the democratic consequences of the voice, but ultimately contained some unsupportable claims. Professor Iverson asserted towards the end of his opinion piece in the, I think it was published in The Australian and The Conversation. This is about democratising identity politics, he said, not entrenching it. Now, these last words can be exposed as immediately wrong. 
because it is about entrenching it. That is the whole point. That's why we're here. Um, and that's why we're heading to a referendum to change our constitution. And that's why we can expect that there could be very serious consequences by entrenching this in our constitution. By entrenching a technically small right to merely make representations on laws and policies of general application, we put front and centre and therefore politicise forevermore the claims, rights and interests of Indigenous Australians over and above the rest of us. If the referendum is carried, prepare yourselves for a flurry of exultant identity practitioners out of the global academy declaring that this is a historic skewer through the heart of the individualism of liberal democracy. But that will just simply be correct. Um, there is none of that in these voices now, but as our own Professor Simon Rice, Simon Rice, a human rights lawyer from the University of Sydney wrote, the international legal community will applaud it. Now, it may be that the human rights international legal community will applaud it, but given the magnitude of this proposal and given that it runs counter to the arc of modern political history, I anticipate there will be some shock and even concern from other parts of the academy including even from moderate progressives and centrists out of the US and Europe, because nothing like this has ever been done before and no one's ever talked about it. Which brings me back to the US and to the uh, recent case in the US Supreme Court, Students for Fair Admissions and Harvard, and its companion case relating to the University of North Carolina. In June, the Supreme Court effectively overturned a fractured line of cases which since 1978 began and continued in various ways to allow race to be an explicit positive factor in university admissions policies. The majority judgment written by the Chief Justice, by Chief Justice Roberts brought this to an end and held that the Equal Protection Clause applies, and I quote, without regard to any difference of race, of colour or of nationality, end quote, and therefore must apply to every person such that quote, eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it. In a concurring opinion, Justice, Th Justice Thomas wrote, while I am painfully aware of the social and economic ravages which have befallen my race and to all who suffer discrimination, I hold out enduring hope that in this country we will live up to the principles so clearly enunciated in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, that all men are created equal, are equal citizens and must be treated equally before the law. Now, these are headline statements and don't reflect really the balance of the case. Uh, much like the predecessor cases, it is more nuanced than that. Um, but the impact of this case has already been grasped. Indeed, the Biden administration has issued guidelines to colleges for ensuring they comply with the court's direction. It confirms that, the, it confirms that quote, the court limited the ability of colleges and universities to, to consider an applicant's race in and of itself as a factor to deciding whether to admit the applicant. However, universities can give weight to any quality or characteristic of a student that bears upon the institution's admission decision, such as courage, motivation or determination, including if the student ties that characteristic to their lived experience with race. This emerges from, Chief Justice's, from the Chief Justice's opinion, which said the decision does not prohibit universities from considering the applicant's discussion about how race affected his or her life. Universities will still be able to implement strategies to recruit and retain talented students from underprivileged backgrounds based on more universal characteristics. This will pick up students who possess those exclusionary immutable characteristics and who are disadvantaged and, 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 who, and, who are disadvantaged and will, of course, include many, many black students. Now, there is no bright line of correctness in any of these thorny issues, but bearing in mind prior to this case, already nine American states had outlawed race-based positive discrimination in college admissions, including California. It is easy to conclude that the Supreme Court is in fact moving with an increasing recognition in the US by some that extreme affirmative action had overreached and was achieving very little while at the same time resulting in damaging, adverse, reverse discrimination. As the Chief Justice said, the guarantee of equal, e equal protection meant one thing when applied to one individual and something else when applied to a person of another colour. Many will differ, but this case and other developments in the US gives us some hope that we can solve complex issues around equality in a liberal democracy with some balance and common sense 
and with an eye to both equality and fairness. Now, I've raised this case only superficially to show the extraordinary counterpoint to what we are proposing with The Voice, which is bereft of balance and indeed common sense. This brings me to the final reason why, our, why we are where we are with The Voice, namely the role of Indigenous people in our constitution and society. In other directly comparable countries with colonial histories, the US, Canada and New Zealand, many Indigenous people are not doing well, uh, but they're not doing as badly as our worst off Indigenous people who are the most incarcerated and dispossessed in the world. Those other countries all have either historical or more recent, what I call light touch, so-called recognition in their constitutions. And as Nicaroni explained earlier, the Canadian constitution in particular recognises the rights of Indigenous people in treaties, but of course those treaties are extra constitutional. Now, that, that provision has had an impact in the, in the development of can, um, Canadian law in relation to Indigenous people, but it's not like, it's nothing like we're proposing with the, vo with the voice, which provides substantive constitutional political rights to Indigenous people over and above other citizens in the text. As Professor Iverson says, this is unique globally. Also, none of these comparable democracies is without one or a few historical treaties between the coloniser and the colonised, which in those countries has alleviated in symbolic and sometimes practical ways the harm caused by the original dispossession. So again, in, in 2023, it is perceived that there is this gap in our constitution, and together with the absence of historical treaties means that in this era of identity politics, we had to find a solution. Since 2007, all Australian coalition leaders have expressed commitment to recognition of Indigenous people in the constitution. So it must be acknowledged that the failure, for whatever reason, and I'm not pointing the finger at anyone, but the failure by the coalition in its decade in power to seize the initiative on Indigenous recognition, to drive this project in a way consistent with moderate conservative values, is undoubtedly one of the reasons we are where we are today. But none of the coalition's failures justify what in 2023 is now being dished up as the solution for so-called recognition in the Australian Constitution of Indigenous People. This project is, of course, course, nothing of the sort. Now, today is not the day to dwell on too much on the features of the voice as they're becoming well known. There is no doubt that its very worst feature is, the, is that the advisory function extends to matters affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which is code for a voice on everything because it extends to laws and policies of general application that affect all Australians. This is the bit that creates the wholesale inequality. Also, because it extends to making representations to the executive government and not just the parliament, and because it mandates a new body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice rather than just a plain old boring representative body in our constitution, it does mean that if the referendum is carried, the constitution will be altered in a very big way. Professor Zaroni and Gerangelos have confirmed that that combination of features including the new chapter, and in particular the new chapter, means that this voice will assume similar constitutional status to the other branches of government in the first three chapters of the constitution, i.e. the parliament, the executive, and the high court. This is why proponents and detractors of this voice characterise it as a fourth arm of government. It, that is how it looks to me in the constitution, and I predict that it will look and act like in society as a novel, because we've never seen this before in any other place, but as a novel advisory arm of government in operation. So this is a truly enormous proposal, and yet there is nothing in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, either the one-pager or the controversial addendum, or the Referendum Council final report in 2017, or indeed in former Chief Justice Murray Gleeson's 2019 landmark speech that required this body's powers to extend to, right, to a right to make representations on laws of general application or to be housed in a new chapter. Had the body been limited to providing representation on special laws under the races clause or even simply to indigenous affairs so that an entrenched representative body was limited to responding to special measures or beneficial laws and policies, I personally would have embraced such a model. I could have voted for a couple of minimalist models drafted by Professor Toomey in 2020. And a lot of people would agree 
uh, with, would disagree with that in this room. But, but this, that sort of model would, would be nothing like we're looking at now. So, alas, there were easier ways to go through this which could have provided both symbolic recognition and a much more restrained, smaller and therefore safer and more unifying substantive right, which is what, since 2014, Indigenous people have demanded. These solutions, while significant, very significant amendments, would not have offended any principle of equality and were not grounded in identity politics. It was effectively, would be effectively balancing out the races clause which provides a special provision for special laws to be made for Indigenous people. However, the custodians of this voice referendum, as much as I do respect their commitment to Indigenous disadvantage, their scholarship and service over many years, and despite having the best of intentions, have been dreaming big. Some of them have correctly characterised this model of, vo of the voice as a new foundational institution of state, which will provide an important reordering of the hierarchy of the state and, quote, provide for a form of transformation in Australia's established constitutional institutions. The Prime Minister has repeatedly told us that this is a modest proposal and it's the model that the, prime, the Indigenous people wanted. He may not appreciate that on both fronts this is simply wrong. It is the preferred model of a handful of academics who have been working on The Voice for years and it is by far the most maximalist and therefore the riskiest and most divisive option suggested in all of our discourse on the voice, at least anything I've seen. The fact that the proposed section 129 is a maximalist rather than a minimalist model is another reason that we are heading to the most divisive referendum in Australia's history. If the proposed section 129 becomes a new chapter nine in the constitution, expect future division, you can expect future division and discord. Rather than enhancing the moral authority of indigenous Australians, it is likely to do the opposite in practice. As its proponents have explained, the voice should be better understood by the political power it invests in Indigenous people rather than the entrenchment itself. To which I say, are you crazy? <laughs> voice proponents again and again seem to equate the possession of political power with the possession of moral force. Yet political scientists would say that these two things are almost mutually exclusive or at least operate on a spectrum where trade-offs must occur. In the context of political institutions, moral force and authority is usually held by those who do not wield political power or who resist wielding political power to the extent that they have it. Think the king and the queen or the, our high court or its judges. Its moral authority is to be maintained, if mor sorry, if moral authority is to be maintained, the, the deployment of political power must be resisted or used sparingly. Political power is very carefully deployed because those who deploy political power frequently, politicians in particular, almost always over time become despised. Believe me, I know, I'm married to a politician. <laughs> Amongst the 24 voice politicians, that will, there will be the good and the bad, the attention seekers and the workhorses, the superstars and the duds. Some voice politicians will be, will be despised and others not. After all, after all, the voice politicians will be human beings, just like the rest of us. Different demographics will respond differently to the voice. I wish it were otherwise, but I do predict that in some parts of the society, the institution will indeed become despised because it is a repository of power, and that's what it is. That stands for only 3.8% of the population, but which will have disproportionate, and some will say an unfair influence over the affairs of all of us. Not all of our affairs, but sufficient number of our affairs for people to dislike that and disapprove of it. It is inevitable that this will bleed negatively into the attitudes of non-Indigenous Australians towards Indigenous Australians. And as Henry Ergas said brilliantly um, yesterday in The Australian, it will sharpen our differences and eliminate scope for mutual accommodation. Henry, yesterday in The Australian, drew attention to the minorities treaties that gave collective rights of political organisation and representation to ethnic minorities out of the Treaty of Versailles post-World War I. Henry wrote, everywhere the effects were disastrous. They crystallised, entrenched and sharpened the differences they were intended to overcome. By elevating dissent into a, a primary and highly visible source of political cleavage, 
and encouraging aggressive minorities to make ever escalating demands, they eliminated the scope for mutual accommodation. I'd seriously ask the question, have the proponents of this voice even thought about this? For all the reasons I've outlined today and our own special history and vulnerability at this point in time means this voice proposal probably could not have happened elsewhere. For the reasons I have not touched on today but will in due course be publishing elsewhere due to unprecedented disparity in spending power as between the yes and no campaigns, a deeply misleading question and government driven big tech censorship of important facts which ac accurately characterise the voice the government and the parliament is presiding over a deeply flawed and unfair process. It is reasonable to say, I think, that this is a kind of modern revolution, or at least an attempted one. Many would counter and say that Section 128 is perfectly suited to help us address this kind of change. After all, it was Edmund Burke who said that a state without the means of change is a state without the means of its conservation. But Burke argued for gradual reforms that could take into account existing traditions and institutions rather than radical change that would lead to chaos due to the loss of hardwired values. The whole of the history of the West has shown that we humans are hardwired for equality, as the US Supreme Court's treatment of race-based college admissions over several decades shows equality is indeed a very complex issue. Entrenching equality is one thing, but entrenching inequality is quite another. When the entrenchment of inequality is of, a kind, is of a kind that will be on full display every day in our national discourse, it will likely lead to, as the Aboriginal elders at Uluru uh, 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 reportedly said in a rather understated way, it will lead to trouble. All of us, but especially our precious Indigenous people, should be terrified of what this will do over time to our country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. Uh, that was just um, a, a brilliant um, piece of writing that we've all enjoyed so much this afternoon. So, um, as was the case this morning, uh, keep the questions coming. Uh, if we have the microphones, can I invite uh, someone who might have a question for Louise? Uh, yes, could we have a microphone brought to this gentleman on the middle table, please? My name is David Phillips, I'm from South Australia, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm a retired research scientist. So, but I'm very interested in these questions. I have two questions. The first one is, you talked about this being sort of an age of identity, and I think it's also an age of anxiety. Uh, there have been things written about that. Maybe it's a question for someone dealing in psychology or so sociology, but do you have any comment on why this sort of overtaking of society by a focus so strongly on identity and anxiety? And if I proceed on to my second question, you mentioned that Australia has no equivalent document like it is self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, in South Australia, Governor Hindmarsh issued a proclamation on the 28th of December 19, 1836 in which he laid out various things. Um, part of it, towards the end, he deals with the application of the law, particularly in relation to what he called native, the native population. And I just want to read a, a short excerpt from it. It is also, at this time especially, my duty to appraise the colonists of my resolution to take every lawful means for extending the same protection to the native population as to the rest of His Majesty's subjects, 
and of my firm determination to punish with exemplary sev severity all acts of violence or injustice which may in any manner be practised or attempted against the natives who are to be considered as much under the safeguard of the law as the colonists themselves, and equally entitled to the privileges of British subjects. It goes on, but uh, emphasising that the native population are to be treated exactly the same as the colonists, and so when South Australia um, inaugurated its first parliament, uh, which was a, a franchise of manhood, women had not at that stage uh, achieved the vote, all Aboriginal men were entitled to vote, stand for election, so on, like any other man in South Australia. So do you think that, which most South Australians have never heard of, could form some sort of role as an important speech in Australia's history? Thank you, David. Oh, David, um, your second question first. I think what you've read out there is one of myriad wonderful speeches um, by many people throughout our history. Um, but of course, Indigenous people weren't always treated in that way. Um, and so there wasn't, um, you know, there was no real substantive equality, in fact, when we were colonised. But that doesn't mean to say that there wasn't a great deal of, um, you know, of goodwill from many people um, towards Indigenous Australians right from the outset. So that, 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 that's sort of self-evident. I've, I've actually heard that um, in recent, that, that read out or by someone else or someone sent me a text or an email. So that is doing the rounds at the moment. Uh, but my point is that, as you say, no one knows about that. Um, but moreover, we haven't put those sorts of sentiments into a document. Um, and my point about that is really we, we just haven't had any education around those speeches or we don't have a place where our values are set out. And that has been good in some ways for us. It does mean that the High Court is not, is not um, deciding what are overtly political questions, but it also means that as a society, we don't really understand this equality thing. And I think that's why this proposal, which, in, which inserts inequality, is, is in serious contention that Australia could actually do this in a few weeks' time. Um, why has this happened now? Well, look, I told you the story about Fukuyama and the end of, um, the end of history, which was supposedly in, um, in uh, 1992, um, but that has just not been the case. And I, so I think the history of all societies and indeed civilizations that is that over time they evolve and um, different um, sources of conflict arise, and one of the big sources of conflict in our modern society at the moment are these sort of tribal identity-based conflicts. And that's the only explanation I have for it. Uh, I think it's Ben, is it, in, in the blazer? Perhaps a microphone could be brought to Ben. Hi, Ben Davies. Thanks, Louise. Can I um, ask you a question on the point you made? You predicted that the voice may well become despised. There's a recent precedent for another uh, Indigenous advisory body that became very despised. That was the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. It lasted only 15 years before it became so despised it was abolished by the Parliament with bipartisan support. Um, the question is, has anyone on your side of the referendum debate looked back to the history of the establishment of ATSIC and the arguments that were put forward at the time because um, I was a lot younger, most of us probably were, but the arguments, if I recall correctly, seem to be very, very similar to those being put in favour of The Voice now. Is there a lesson of history that we can learn there? Um, ben, look, I think that lesson is that you don't entrench something like this. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. I mean, we have, we've had another lesson in more recent times, and, and that is the uh, Western Australian uh, heritage, Aboriginal heritage laws, um, which were terrible laws and, um, you know, a case of 
the laws are devised by bureaucrats. I mean, it was very clear that those laws really didn't come from Indigenous people on the ground wanting that level of oversight over land management. Um, and those, I think they were, they were on the, the law was on the statute books for six weeks and quickly <coughs> taken off because it, it threatened the, the success of this referendum in Western Australia and indeed across the entire country. But again, it just goes to show that laws, can, laws come and go, and they always have. And, and, and back to a point that someone else made earlier is that the reason why we've never seen groups um, constitutionalised is that the, the, the demands, the, the rights and the interests of groups over history change, and it makes sense for a polity to have a degree of flexibility uh, around how we organise and give voice to the you know, to to certain groups, and we've always had that, and that's just a matter of common sense. Um, but it seems to me that the the proponents, indeed the architects of this particular model, um, did not even think about the fact that it was a group right or characterise it in that way. Um, so I don't think they really held it because there was no sort of diversity viewpoint uh, viewpoint diversity amongst the group that gave it to the Prime Minister on a silver platter saying, look, this has all been looked at and here it is, you can trust us and some conservatives agree with it. Um, that They didn't even hold it up in the light and say, what have we created here? Um, and so, again, I, they weren't even thinking, I don't think, about the idea that this was a group right and therefore what are the consequences of that and why throughout history have we never done this before? Look. There are many, many lessons from history, Ben, about why we wouldn't do this. Um, and the reason I went through what I did today is that we're, in Australia, we're not very good with history. Um, uh, our journalists, our, our media, our academy, um, we just, we're not big on history and that's because we have a fairly short history, relatively, and as I said, our histories are borrowed from others to a large extent. Stay there, Louise. Stay there, Louise. Um, Across to Alan there. Well, thank you, Louise. Uh, I agree with every word you said when it comes to Australia and how bad this will be. But I do feel you have a wildly optimistic view about the cancerous reach of identity politics in North America. I'm not just relying on my accent here. Let me start with my native Canada. It has an equality provision in an entrenched constitution. It has a full bill of rights. And I can tell you that identity politics is orders of magnitude worse in Canada than it is here. Mm -hmm. um, Jordan Peterson yesterday lost at the Court of Appeal on an issue where they're sending him back for re-education. My law school was named, my Canadian law school was named after the first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald. His name has been taken off the law school. His statutes are being taken, statutes, statues are being taken down everywhere. Uh, and he was the first Prime Minister of Canada. He was singly responsible for the country being there and his sin was to carry on the policies of the left-wing Liberal Party and in that sense Australia has moved to the same terminology as Canada with the Liberal Party being the main left-wing party um, but <laughs> let, let me just let me just say so Canada is awful and none of these utopian uh, ex, you know, exclamations in the Constitution have done anything in the US I've had three sabbaticals including at Cornell Law School, and it is way worse. The cancerous reach of identity is way worse in the US than it is here in Australia. I'm a critic of Australia. We are the world's best in the Anglosphere right now. That's how bad the rest of the world is. Um, and so to point to these sort of flowing declarations like Jefferson's, and remember the American Revolution was partly driven by the, the Brits not wanting expansion into uh, you know, Indian lands and the settlers or the colonists wanting to expand. And so I just don't see how you can point to these flowing declarations in North America and say this might make things better. We have lived through three years of lockdowns where you can't point to a single court in the Anglosphere that used the Bill of Rights to do anything to stop them. So I just don't agree with that part. Jim, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, <laughs> No, I am, because I think, look, you do a thousand words and then you read out 5,000 words and you still can't say everything that you think. And the thing I would say about that is that identity politics came from 
Europe and North America. I mean, we were late to get it and we're still going through it. Um, it is very bad over there. It is, it is shocking. Um, so I, and these forces are global forces. Um, so the idea that, you know, it's um, worse here than there, that's not what I'm saying. My point about the Harvard case is that they've been going through this in a big way and having big battles about it. My point, the, well, the point I tried to convey, but obviously not that well, is that, is that at least they have something to reach to when they have a debate. And we just have nothing. Um, and for that reason, we're vulnerable because we're not even having a debate. I mean, this forum right now, as far as I know, is the only forum where there are a number of lawyers, not just lawyers, but other interested people who are generally opposed to The Voice, and we've had uh, Scott Stevenson here who was promoting it, um, in, in the whole of Australia. Um, and, and the writ is about to be issued. Um, and so I do think, I mean, as I said, this is good and bad. Our, we're, we're terrific here in many ways. We are a very easygoing culture. But because we're so easygoing, we are vulnerable to this. There has just been no fight back. Um, and that's because we don't have much to go to. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Um, when I first started advocating in this space, well, I, I wrote a piece in the, um, the Australian last year, and I was inundated with people saying, keep going. And nearly every one of those was a lawyer, a, a retired superior court judges, suburban solicitors, barristers from all over the country. Um, but the reality is that there are that, not that many public lawyers in Australia. Most of the very good public lawyers uh, uh, have government practices. And so they are feeding their families with their government practices. Most of the public lawyers who have the capacity to interrogate this and, and really explore it and scrutinise it, most of the public lawyers who do applicant work in the High Court, I'm talking practitioners here, um, and there's not that many of them because it's, you know, when the cases come up, they can be a, any number of people doing it, but there are a handful of people who do specialise in applicant work in the High Court. Apart from retired lawyers, um, most of those applicant lawyers would like to be doing government work. <laughs> and so I came very early in this to realise, as someone who had in my past, when I lived in Sydney and had a practice that was 80% Commonwealth administrative and public law, um, if I was still there doing that, which I don't do anymore, um, I would not be doing this because my entire practice would would disappear overnight. And that is not because I say that the Attorney General would say, you know, off with her head, that's it for her. But you only need one or two people in the bowels of uh, the Attorney General's department to say, take her off the list. So that is why lawyers who are qualified to do this are not speaking up. And that is a function of government becoming incredibly big in our society. Um, I mean, the other example I draw your attention to is that Clayton Newts, my, my alma mater, um, some might recall that it was announced in the AFR a couple of months ago that um, they were going neutral on The Voice um, rather than positive, where all the other national law firms and other law firms had, had months beforehand said, well, we're, we're all for The Voice. Um, and a new CEO came in and suddenly they've said, no, no, we don't mean that anymore. Now, I don't know anything about what happened in, inside Clayton Newts, but I did read in the AFR a few weeks ago that it was at the top of the billings for Commonwealth government, well, perhaps for all government work. So Clayton Newts has $30 million per annum at the moment at the top of the league's table um, billings for government work. So that is why lawyers are not standing up, and that's why um, this this identity politics, which shuts everything down, 
is such a threat to democracy. That's why political philosophers all over the world have been writing about it for years, actually. Um, I don't know that we've got any Australian political philosophers who write terribly critically of it, but there certainly are a lot in the US. So, look, I think the, the good thing about the US, I mean, it's a mess. There's no doubt about that. But, but at least they're having big fights about it. And I think that's important. Other gentlemen in yeah, uh, Ken Phillips, Louise. Uh, when I look at the design of the of the voice from a managerial structure, this thing has been put together in a very, very deliberate way. There's nothing haphazard about this, nothing unthought about it. The voice will have 24 representatives. There is no defined way in which those 24 representatives are going to be selected. The proposal in the voice is for a process to create a process to select those 24 people. Um, the model for the selection that is, which is not recommended is for a democratic process of, ind of Indigenous people voting one on one for their 24 representatives. Those 24 representatives will be part time except for the two co-chairs who will be full-time and fully paid and they will direct the massive bureaucracy that will be the voice. It is a something that has been deliberately put together and will in fact create a massive concentration of power in the hands of two people, one male and one female, who will control and dictate, or be in a position managerially to control and dictate, what the voice says Indigenous people say. And they will not have a, a, a defined process in terms of how that's selected. So I, I beg to disagree that this is something that hasn't been thought through. The managerial structure suggests something completely different. Oh, look, I... I never said it hasn't been thought through in, in that way. I'm saying that they, I think what I said was no one's thought about the unintended consequences. Now, um, there's been a lot of complaint about insufficient detail and I think the yes people are right to say, well, look, you know, we've got something over here and this is how we see it. But, I mean, as a constitutional lawyer, I agree with the commentary that you couldn't codify all of that in the constitution. So if you're going to have a voice, which I completely um, you know, oppose, or at least this kind of voice, um, you would leave it to Parliament. And those things that you've mentioned do come straight from the Karma Langton report, which does give us... I mean, I, you should read it if you haven't read it. It's 200 pages and it's, it's a fairly clear and, and, you know, from my point of view, um, a, a fairly bold assertion of what the voice hopes to achieve. I mean, it will be really embedded with government and the parliament, with the government and the parliament and the public service at every step of the way. Um, but look, the parliament can change, it doesn't need to adhere to that, it might not go through in that way. So we can't really say what it will look like um, because the parliament will control those sorts of things. Uh, the thing that the parliament can't control is the entrenchment and that is the right to make representations to the executive and the parliament on matters affecting um, ATSI people, but that's that's on anything that they consider affects them. So that's 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 the entrenchment. The rest we we really don't know. They've given us an idea, but um, no, I agree with you. They have thought it through. Um, my my concern is about the unintended consequences of the entrenchment, the inequality impacts in the Constitution and therefore in society. Uh, the, the gentleman in the light blue here, thank you. Uh, Louise, um, I'm Stephen Ingate from Sydney. Um, you mentioned the Attorney General and more importantly the Solicitor General. Um, the Solicitor General had three attempts to finally come up with an advice that the government uh, was happy to release, talking about 
the proposal being constitutionally sound, and no one knows what that means, isn't the government and the Attorney General um, perhaps going to be somewhat exposed if there's more pressure put on the government to release the original Solicitor General's advice, which would seem to be, um, one would guess, um, arguing against the threat to extend the voice to the executive, which the Attorney General took to his uh, committee, can we get rid of this? <coughs> and the voice spoke there and then, said, no, we will not do what the government wants, we will do what we want. Uh Look, the government's been under a lot of pressure to do a lot of things and they're not doing it. I think the last thing they'll ever do is release any advice given to them by the Solicitor General. I mean, they don't have to. Why would they? It's privileged. Governments can hold on to advices or they'll release them if it suits them politically. Uh, I, don't, I don't see anything coming that will help anyone because I just don't think they'll ever release that advice. And if they're... I mean, there's been, in the media, you get this sort of narrative that there's an advice and, this, and people assume what it would contain. I mean, we just, I know having, you know, actually given advices, many advices to governments, including the Commonwealth Government, that um, what people think are in, in advices, often not what are in advices. So, um, look, I, no, I don't, think, I don't think the government feels any pressure at all. I think that this is a break, a crash or crash through proposition and they made a decision early on that they would uh, not give details because details become problematic in, in a political sense in a referendum campaign. And I, I think they were smart to do that actually. Now that, that will be held against them by some people and it will be part of the slogan, if you don't know, vote no. But I think releasing more details probably would have been, could have yielded you know, worse things, and you'd still get that slogan anyway, I think, because they're not going to release all details. So I, th I think they've been very uh, clever politically in how they've, they're pursuing this. It's risky, um, no doubt, and no one knows where it will end up, but I don't think they'll be releasing any advice. Alrighty, uh, someone has pointed to their watch uh, at me. So we've got time for one uh, more question and I think the gentleman there with the microphone, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time, Louise. Um, uh, Chris Secker from, from Red Union. Um, I think if, if, if the voice of parliament succeeds, I, I don't think it will be a win for Australian uh, constitutional uh, democracy, but at the same time, I, I think if the no vote succeeds, I, I don't think there'll be any winners. What can this movement do and, and, and the broader Australian legal profession as a whole do in the event that the no vote succeeds to show some humility and um, show that we're ultimately still in respect of the, the First Nations people of this country um, uh, were, were a no vote to succeed? Thanks. Yeah, look, that is such a good question. Um, because I know that um, you know, I don't enjoy uh, becoming a sort of public voice on something where a lot of my friends, my progressive friends and other friends that I have who are not political friends won't scratch their heads and say, what, what, what is she doing? It's not much fun. And I don't think um, that um, there'll be parties in, in no camps or... Um, amongst people who are uh, perhaps mostly Liberal Party members who stand on the booths who have the terrible job of doing that on referendum day. So uh, that's why I say it's a lose-lose proposition. Um, and the reason I decided to keep going with my advocacy, I didn't think I would when I first wrote my first piece, but as I say, it's sort of snowball because I realised I was in a unique position to engage in this advocacy. Um, one of the reasons I kept going is that, because, is, was, is that I thought that whilst a no vote will be terrible for the country, um, a yes vote um, long term will be worse um, because I could foresee this continuing division and escalation, uh, increasing lack of accommodation of mutual interests rather than the other. So, look, uh, I, I think... Peter Dutton said, made some commitment to um, perhaps a recognition referendum. I, I don't, I think I saw that somewhere. Um, I, don't, I don't know that anyone will have an appetite for all of that 
very soon. It's a shame that we're not having a referendum on Indigenous recognition. Um, I, I think it's going to be bad for the country. It, it, but um, I, I don't think we should be concerned as a country about what, as some people have said to me, but what will the New York Times say? Um, no, in all seriousness, I mean, I have done a lot of quiet advocacy amongst other groups that's not public around boardroom tables and in sort of the little battalions of society. And one very senior non-executive director said to me, look, I agree with you, it's going to be a disaster, but we have to do it anyway because what will the world think of us? And no, 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 seriously, uh, this, is, this is actually, I get this from a lot of senior lawyers and senior company directors who I speak to. They really do think that. Um, now, a, con a, conserv a, con a constitutional conservative would never accept that because we know that we have to get it right and that if you get it wrong, it will have terrible consequences. But look, I, I, don't, I don't have a, an answer to your question. I just, um, the reason I'm doing this is that I think that the, um, that this so-called cure um, that is being promoted for all the ills of Indigenous disadvantage, and as I said, there are very, very many. I mean, I don't think this is the cure that we want or need. Uh, thank you, Louise. Um, would you all please join me in thanking Louise for her very thoughtful presentation. And before I take my seat, I will invite uh, the executive